Hello there, friends. I hope you guys are all enjoying your leftover turkey day sandwiches uh, because, you know, Steve, exercise, digestion, they're the same freaking thing, especially when you eat a lot of stuff. Now, we've done a lot of different character breakdowns for Andor so far. We've taken a look at everyone from Luthen Rael to Cyril Karn, Dedra Miro to Kano Loy, and of course, Darth Sidious. But the one character we really haven't taken a look at too closely is Andor, who's the main character. Now, in a show like this, it's natural for Andor to be one of the less interesting characters. He is the vehicle for the story from which the audience gets to watch the narrative unfold. If you make that vehicle a bit too unstable or eccentric, it might make the entire show not very watchable to the maximum amount of people possible. And so Andor, as a main character, it kind of needs to be a bit more vanilla, more relatable to a larger audience. And so the color and all the character and the craziness, that comes from the supporting characters who might have a more polarizing reception from the viewers. Like Cyril, some can't stand him and others can get enough of him and Dedra. But this is a relatively simple view of who Cassian Andor is. He's no Vinny Chase or Superman. When Cassian gets rid of his mustache, he shaves it like the rest of us. Like all of the characters in the show, he is a complex individual with many different desires and internal struggles. In a lot of ways, he's like an updated modern take on the Han Solo character. Except unlike Han, who I love, he's like my favorite Star Wars character, and or realistically suffers consequences from his actions, and sometimes suffers because of things completely outside of his realm of control. Andor, in many ways, is a cursed character. We all know how his life will come to an end. And now that we've seen his beginning, are we all that surprised that he has a permanent scowl on his face? Yet it's a testament to Tony Gilroy's skill as a director that he's able to weave such an epic story about a character we all know the end of. And that's because in Andor, Cassian does change his great character development. But before we get there, a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode, ownersaber.com. We got some great Black Friday deals that end November 30th. So you're gonna wanna check these out. If you guys buy two of any of their lightsabers, you'll get $100 off automatically at checkout. And if you buy three, you'll get $150 off of your entire purchase. Now, for those of you who want to just purchase one lightsaber, you can use our promo code PORG, that's all caps, to get 20% off. Ownersaber.com has a great range of lightsabers, including these dueling sabers that are great for sparring and really heavy use. You can really bash these things. And they also have more premium and unique saber hilt designs that are packed with all sorts of functions and really cool sound effects. And plus, they're all really beautiful to look at and they feel awesome to hold. My personal lightsaber is the first done. This is a replica of Obi-Wan Kenobi's first and second lightsaber. It is terrific for Form 3 adherents who like to play the defensive role until their enemy tires and then you get the stabby stabby. Check out the description down below if you want more information on ownersaber.com. It's sponsors like them that allow us to continue making the content we really like even if the algorithm wants us to do something else. In an interview with Polygon titled Why Revolutions Are Always Relevant, Tony Gilroy talks about how from the very beginning he planned on having Andor uh, be at the mercy of Luthen Rael at the end of season one. When Andor spots Luthen during the Ferex riot, he quickly understands that the only reason why Luthen is here is the same reason why everyone is here. They're all gunning for him. Yet at the end of the riots, when Andor safely makes it to Zorby's shipyard, he decides not to escape with the rest of his friends. Instead, he goes and confronts Luthen Rael. Andor has every opportunity to kill the spy master before he sees him, but instead he leaves his briar pistol on a crate and allows Luthen Rael to pick it up, and then he says the following. Kill me. Or take me in. It's at this moment that I kind of had a flashback to what Andor was like at the beginning of the series. Before Cassie and Andor, who crawled through a river of shit and came out clean on the other side. Do you remember what he was like the first time we saw him? He was just another lowlife, living in a broken down ship in the dumps of Ferrix. He owed everyone in town a bit of credits. He had several priors and he only cared about two things really, his family, looking for his sister, and of course his mother Marva. The other thing he cared about was just simply surviving. Now Andor had to be forced to leave Ferrix. Had he never been involved with that scuffle with those corporal guards, had Cyril Carr never taken the initiative to track him down, Everything we've seen in this show might have never happened and Andor might still be out ruining your health and reputation with friends of low character. 
And so when Andor leaves Ferrix, he had no choice. Remember this parallel sequence of shots that pair young Andor leaving with Marva and Clem and Andor leaving with Luthen? These two moments were both the beginning of a new phase in Andor's life. Except, of course, the part where Andor joins Luthen and then joins the Rebellion, well, there's a hiccup in that plan. The incident on Ferrix wasn't enough to really turn Andor into a real rebel, which is kind of the entire point of the first year of this show. Andor has been running his entire life, looking for stability. He's not going to throw what little he has left to join some crazy rebellion. And so, for now, to keep Andor focused and interested in his plan, Luthen uses money as bait. Which is really the only way you're going to get someone with Andor's mindset to basically risk his neck. It's better to leave. Better to eat, sleep, do what you want. So during the Aldani Rake arc, Andor is an outsider looking in. He finds out two things immediately. One, he's a very capable individual. His years of being a criminal and ruffian has prepared him very well for the life of being a mercenary. And two, whether he realizes it or not, being a mercenary does not sit with him very comfortably. His mother, Marva, always kind of knew this about him. Tell him he knows everything he needs to know and feels everything he needs to feel. When the day comes that those two pull together, he will be an unstoppable force for good. Whether it's Cyril's mom or Marva and or, or even Jabba the Hutt, mothers always know their sons the best. Now during the Aldani raid, we begin to see some cracks emerge in the armor that Andor has placed around himself to protect himself from caring too much about anything other than Cassian. And it's Nemec who exploits this. He's a poet warrior, a man with a beautiful soul, and is honest, clear-eyed, and unapologetic with his words. And those words, they pierce right through Andor. And after finding out that Andor was a mercenary and not a revolutionary, Nemec comes to a very pragmatic understanding of the role of mercenaries in this war. My faith doesn't calm me. I believe in something. Why am I so unsettled? I mean, you have nothing. You sleep like a stone. Andor is taken aback by Nemec's words here. Although he probably understands that Nemec isn't trying to insult him, the truth can really hurt when it comes from someone you respect. And then Nemec goes on to methodically describe what Andor is to this revolution. The role of mercenaries in the galactic struggle for freedom. My conclusion is simple. Weapons are tools. Those that use them are, by extension, functional assets that we must use to our best advantage. The Empire has no moral boundaries. Why should we not take hold of every chance we can? To be a weapon, to be a tool without any self-determination, it sits wrong with Andor. And we see Andor during this raid slowly awaken until in the final moment, he kills the actual person who has no cause, no purpose, Skeen. Skeen attempts to try to take all the loot for himself and Andor stops him. As Marva said, Andor can't help but become a force for good. Now let's go back to that scene from the finale real quick. Luthen Ryle is the other half of this decision. He's the one holding the gun. And during this season, this entanglement he has with Andor, he undergoes his own change as a result. As each episode reveals a bit more information about who Luthen Ryle is, we begin to realize that this is a husk of a man. He has given literally everything to the cause. He'll stop at nothing now to preserve what he's built. Remember, he sends Vel and Cinta to kill Andor after realizing that he might be a liability. And who's to blame him? After those conversations he's had with Andor on the Fondor, this man clearly stands for nothing. Oddly enough, Luthen Rael also lacks a foundation. Aside from fighting for the rebellion, the man doesn't really stand for much. He is whatever the cause needs him to be, and so when Lonnie begins to question whether he can continue acting as a mole within the ISB, Luthen delivers this stunning speech. I've given up all chance at inner peace. I made my mind a sunless space. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago from which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. He does this to shame Lonnie into continuing his service. And that's because that is what the Rebellion needs from Luthen Ryle, and so he will reveal a bit of himself to Lonnie to get exactly what he wants. And then later on, he meets with Saw Guerrera. The rebel warlord challenges him. This is a man who's gone further than anyone in his dedication to revolution, anarchy, and chaos. Luthen Ryle once again reveals a bit of himself to Saw. What are you? I'm a coward. 
Our man is terrified the Empire's power will grow beyond the point where we can do anything to stop it. The best lies are usually sandwiched with a lot of truth, and what Luthen Rael tells the Saw Gerrera here is relatively true. But it's really just a message, again, that he wants Saw to hear. Stand alone, wait too long, and the Empire will be unstoppable. You need to join forces with Anton Krieger. But that first part where Luthen Rael says, I'm a coward, look at his face, look at how tired he is. Look at how insecure. The only time you ever see Luthen Ryle like this is when he's back in his antique shop where he feels safe and at home and he's able to be himself. He takes the multiple masks that he usually wears off. This is the true Luthen Ryle. No matter how disciplined or strong-willed he might seem, the weight of the rebellion is crushing him slowly to death. And so when he speaks of cowardice, he's talking about the truth. But his cowardice isn't about waking up one day and being afraid the Empire has taken over. That's not cowardice at all. That's just being pragmatic and logical, something that Saw really needs help with. What makes Luthen Ryle a coward is when he sends Anton Krieger to his death instead of finding the courage to do the right thing and also preserve his ISB contact at the same time. It's impractical. It's irrational. It's something that Anakin Skywalker would have done. That crazy boy, no matter how dicey things got there at the end with the youngling killing and domestic abuse, well, he always tried to save everyone. He always refused to accept things for the way they were, and if he had no path, he would make a path all by himself. Now, in the larger picture, people like this are usually liabilities and can cause a lot of problems, but if you're Anton Krieger and you're pinned down by, you know, overwhelming Imperial forces, you want someone like Anakin in your corner. The other thing that makes Luthen Rael a coward was his desire to kill Andor. He knew so little about the man before he decided to order a hit on him. I mean, Andor could have easily told on him, revealed his identity, but at the same time, he could easily become a great hero for the rebellion. And by being a coward, by being selfish about protecting himself, he starves the rebellion of a great hero. And sure, he feels bad what he's about to do to Anton Krieger and even admits it for a short moment. You think it's worth losing Krieger? I did. I'm not sure right now. What if it was me? And that's because Luthen Ryle has sort of come to terms with the fact that... I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life! Luthen has decided that in order to fight the Empire, he must become like the Empire. Andor emerged out of Aldani with a better understanding of himself. When greed and credits tempted him, he found out that he indeed was actually a decent human being. That doesn't make him a rebel just yet, unfortunately for him. As I've said in previous videos, the Force is in fact in Andor. You just have to look closely to see it. And in this case, it's what I like to call the cosmic force. It's the very fabric of the galaxy. It's what created Anakin out of thin air. And this cosmic force has a plan for Andor. It pushes him relentlessly towards rebellion. And when a hero decides to go against his fate and the force gods, well, Nymos happens. Everything about the scene was just so weird. The music was off, a bit distorted. It was good music mind you. The vibe was also really wrong, as was the color correction. It all felt wrong, that Andor would be allowed to enjoy himself now that he's seen the struggle, taken Nemec's still-worn manifesto into his own possession. The Force works in mysterious ways, and on that day, the Force decided to act through a shore trooper who just locks up Andor for absolutely no reason. And he's not sent to any Imperial prison, mind you. Um, it's poetic, I guess, but he's sent to a secret labor camp for Death Star components. And even though the poor men in this building have no idea what they're building, it doesn't matter, they'll never be let out alive. It's here that Andor becomes far more than just a mercenary. He becomes an agitator, a rebel leader. He lifts up the spirits of the broken men inside these walls who have become conditioned by shock therapy like dogs. He awakens the beast of a man known as Kino Loy, an individual that all the prisoners look up to. And it's through Kino Loy that Andor starts a true revolution in this tiny little corner of the galaxy. When Andor escapes, he still isn't a revolutionary yet. Despite the fact that his actions have now led to dozens if not hundreds of men escaping a prison, but things haven't really changed for Andor. Remember in the beginning of this video, I, talk, I talked about the two things that matter most to Andor, and that is survival and his family, which he doesn't really know that Marva's dead yet, but more on that later. 
But let's talk about survival. When there's an authoritarian regime like the Empire out to hunt down people like him and lock him up for no reason for the rest of his life, surviving is not enough. Surviving in Narkina 5 means dying a cruel death many years down the road from a massive stroke like Olaf did. Andor learns in this prison that he must fight for a lot more than just mere survival. And this is a really big change from who he was at the beginning of the show. You were on the ground in Mimban for six months. You came in as a cook. You lived because you ran. Now let's flash back real quickly to Andor returning home after the Eldani raid, and this is the last time he sees Marva alive. Andor has enough cash to bring his mom along with him on an adventure, but she refuses. She talks about rebellion in a feverish way, but I imagine these are just the wishful ramblings of an old woman who knows she's about to pass. Their relationship is such a beautiful one. It's unspoken, but their love for each other is so pure. So pure that Andor's uh, actions on, on Donnie are what inspire his mother to believe that the rebellion is here on Ferrix. The garrison of Aldani. I heard that. I put on my best coat and I walked across the square with a smile on my face. If there are heroes brave enough to take on a whole Imperial garrison, I'm brave enough to stick it out here. And Marvel, like the caring mother she is, well, she hurts herself trying to unblock the prison tunnels to let in the rebels that will one day storm the hotel rebels like Andor. Now Andor ultimately leaves without his mom because she's too sick really to go anywhere. But before he goes, Marva tells him to forget about his sister. What happened there was not your responsibility. You were a child. Let it go. She absolves Andor of his obligations to family and when she passes soon after, well, Andor is left with no family, and that's quite sad, but when a man has no family, when he has no longer any obligations, well, he makes the perfect rebel. He's prepared. Although it takes one last scene. When Andor finally comes back and finds out that Marva is dead, he finds Brasso, who is now his keeper. I mean, he uses Marva, or what's left of her, as a melee weapons and crushes some Imperial skulls. And he also carries a message from Marva to Andor which he says in the most tender way, showing us the duality of this very, very lovable character. Tell him he knows everything he needs to know and feels everything he needs to feel. And when the day comes that those two pull together, he will be an unstoppable force for good. And now Andor is finally awakened. He has prepared all the things that have happened to him along the way in this first season. Every one of these episodes was crucial in this development. He is now ready to become a rebel, and so he waits on Luthen Ryle's ship for the Spy Master to return. If Luthen Ryle hadn't witnessed the riot on Ferrix, that stirring speech of Marva, an old woman who started a revolution in ways he never thought was possible, he most likely would have killed Andor when he returned to the ship without even thinking. But take a look at the scenes when the camera goes on to Luthen Ryle while he's listening to Marva's speech. Listen to what Marva's saying here. There is a wound that won't heal at the center of the galaxy. There is a darkness reaching like rust into everything, into everything around us. The Empire is a disease that thrives in darkness. It is never more alive than when we sleep. In a show full of amazing speeches, they just keep giving you more amazing speeches, and I wish I had another Alan who could take all these freaking ideas in my head before they slip away and write it into more scripts. <sighs> Never have enough time or claymores to keep the dolphins away to, to say everything I want to say. And that's because this speech means something different to every person who's listening to it, and to Luther and Ryle, this speech, this talk of great wounds and darkness, it's supposed to remind him of the great loss he's suffered so far. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago from which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. A tremendous sacrifice. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my, my eagerness to fight, has set me on a path from which there's no escape. The hidden costs of what it means to lose one's own identity. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost, and by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my, what is my sacrifice? There's something so honest about this character. There's something so honest about how the show approaches what a revolution actually is. 
If you've ever met a rebel, a real revolutionary, you know that they don't look or act like Luke and Leia. It's the truth. I mean, they're oftentimes scarred mentally and physically by the terrible things that they've seen, they've done, the horrible, overwhelming odds that they've had to survive. The more brutal the regime that they fought against, the heavier the stain is on their soul. In Hollywood sugarcoats revolutions, Star Wars sugarcoats revolutions, making it fun for young and impressionable people, but most revolutions fail. Most rebels become the very thing they fight against if they survive. It's not to say that rebellions are not necessary. They are so necessary. It is a crucial factor in the balancing game we call humanity. Revolutions are so, so hard. There's such a thin margin for success, for not losing yourself. And, uh, you know, Tony Gilroy says in interviews that he's an amateur historian, but he's clearly someone who's paid a lot of attention to real life rebellions and how they're carried out. And you can tell by the way he writes, how he creates these characters, that he understands this very, very nuanced aspect of human behavior. In the story of Luthen Rael, since the very first moment we saw him, it could have really gone in either direction. But the speech from Marva, the speech about the wound in his heart, about the darkness that spreads like a disease, it's, it's awakened him just a little bit and closed that wound just a bit. I'm not saying he's completely saved and he'll become like Mon Mothma one day, but there's a chance that he's not completely damned. Maybe he can begin to trust once again, to have hope. A lot of people think courage comes from rushing at machine gun nests, and looking big and tough, and while those things are definitely a part of it. But for everyday people, courage can come from surprising places. It can be as simple as trusting other people, being open-minded, giving a person a chance when no one else will. Courage is about not becoming so broken by terrible prior experiences that you no longer can show kindness to anyone else. Courage is not about being naive. Courage is about knowing the risks, but taking a chance anyway and believing in the goodness of others. Rebellions, the good ones, at least the ones that Mon Matha will one day lead, will be built on such trust, goodwill, and courage.